Hello and welcome. It's week 11, it's Friday evening, and you know what that means. It's time for some Indie Pro 2000 action. We're at the Circuit de Spa Frank or Champs here this evening. It delivered last season and it's set up to deliver yet another belter here in season two of 2021. My name is Tom Davis. I'll be taking you through as much of this evening's action as I possibly can. The drivers are out qualifying. I'm joined in the commentary box by the wonderful Gary Weaver, and we'll get to him in a second, but a lot to talk about coming into this one. Notably, Nikolai Hoheim is having a fantastic week, and your two championship contenders, Anne Medema and Christoph Herbignel, they're locked together so far as well, in third and fourth in this week's standings. They're all in this heat that we have here this evening, so we've got all of the big players that you could possibly ask for, and a few of the fan favorites, such as Frank Nguyen, Leah Bob, Ozaretskovskaya is here as well. What more could you ask for? Iconic track, iconic drivers. Bring in you now, Gary Weaver. Gary, how are you doing? Sure, your first time on the Indie Pro, I believe, but uh, <laughs> I bet you're excited. Definitely the first time on the Indie Pro, but not the first time at Spa, whether, uh, Actually, I don't believe I've done commentary at Spawn now that I think about it, but I've done quite a few races here, and uh, El Rouge and Radion are going to be definitely a, quite a sight to see in these cars. So, uh, first impressions, absolute terror uh, is what it would be if I was driving this series for sure. But man, with, with everything here, the second to last week as well in the championship, it, it's going to be something to watch for sure. It should be absolutely mega. Your championship contenders, by the way, coming into this race, they're separated by about 60 points, and there's about triple that on offer at any given week, so it really is all to play for at the moment. We're looking forward to a fantastic one. Remember last season when we had Greg Seitz versus Jack Ashton, the showdown in this very week, actually. After this one, we got one more still to come, so it's not the be-all and end-all, but it... It would certainly be helpful if you could get a good result, would you say? <laughs> yeah, definitely be uh, pretty much the, the top tier kind of thing here is just focus on two things basically coming into this race, racing the track in some cases, as well as just, well, keeping an eye on where your championship contenders are and see how things play out throughout this event. Yeah, it, it is a track that you have to race, actually, because you can't take it quite so lightly as we sometimes see a few of the venues, you know, this one is reminiscent in of the Nürburgring round, actually, in that it will bite you. These corners, it's sure it's not as walled as the street circuit that we went to at the beginning of this season, but it, the walls are there to meet you. You go off at a Rouge or Radion, where at the moment we catch somebody going up, the wall's right there on the right hand side. It will catch you out. It will end your race if you're not careful. So it's, it is a case of risk versus reward and your setup is also a bit funny in that you got this huge straight that we just saw car number four that's nikolai hoheim who we're speaking about having a, a great week you don't want any downforce because downforce means drag and you got that massive camel straight and you're near enough flat through rouge and radion as well a little bit of a confidence lift maybe but then you get towards this middle sector where it's all fast corners and you want your car set up to be the opposite it's it's a balancing act and a half, isn't it, really? Yeah, you have to make sure that your car can not only handle Orush and Radion and that huge elevation change, but as well as this section of the track, Buhan, and uh, I've gone wide here quite maybe uh, too many times, I'd like to admit, where it's, again, just this fast section. It's probably my most favorite section around here as well, just after Buhan, this quick right-left sequence of corners and then going all the way down towards that Kemmel Strait. Yeah, and then you get to this section, which is arguably even more important because you come out that right-hander, you're then through this incredibly quick one, and now you're flat for miles and miles is what it feels like. Technically, there's a couple corners. That one is 15, then you get up towards 16 and 17, otherwise referred to as Blanchemon. I'm sure you'll recognize that name. And it makes the overtake a little bit more tricky because the track's always curving. You've got to respect your opponent all the time and then you're eyeing up this huge braking zone into the modern day bus stop. Slow it down as much as you dare, take as much curb as you dare as well to open up the line, flat out the final corner, and actually the timing line is very, very quick upon you. That lap from Nikolai Hoheim, not quite an improvement, he's almost a tenth away actually, and that'll drop him down to third position behind Herb Neo and Tulio, so 
good laps for those guys at the moment. And Alessandro de Tullio has been absolutely amazing. 212.1, which is quicker than I've seen in the time trials. That is impressive. And so far, only the top three are separated by 10th. And next thing you know, we get to the number 20 of Kosan, who's in fourth place, suddenly five tenths back, just like the rest of the field. So these these top three have just got an absolutely amazing setup here. And all oh, the 12, wow, a great, <laughs> actual great gap. Plus one, two, three, four. That's the first time I've seen that in actual, <laughs> in actual time. Yeah, that's, that's, that is an interesting I mean, it's it's something for your stats fans out there. Somebody will be writing that down so they can remind us in four or five years' time that it happened once <laughs> it's But that's qualifying nearing the end, shall we say. There's a couple people still technically on laps, which we in green has yet to yet to set a quick valid one, actually. At the moment, his best time is a 2.16.2, so he'll be a long way down the grid. But we'll wait for the grid to come in, as you mentioned. The the top four, a little bit of a breakaway, it would seem. Alessandro Di Tullio will be on pole position in the number six car. Alongside him, Christoph Herbinho, your championship leader, coming into this round using the number one. And the second row is Nikolai Hoheim and Maxime Casson. P5 and P6 is Leobov Ozaretskovskaya and Anne Medema not having a great performance. Almost six and a half tenths away. David Dendelot is seventh and Mark Zudhoff is who you'll find in P8. Your top 10 rounded out by Servi Seppa and Claudio Visparelli, two people that we know have good race pace in general. Havard Galuxin stops your next 10 runners, and alongside him, you'll find Marcel van der Berg in the number 10 car. 13th is Frank Nguyen. Another bad qualifying for him, but he's good at overtaking. He won't be worried. Alexander Tristian is who you'll find alongside Frank. P15 and 16 are Jeffrey Kernusfeld and Connor Melia. And 17 and 18, Victor Reyes and Marcus Frentz. Already you're over two seconds away. And like we mentioned, Mikko Nittimaki, a long way down for Finland. And rounding out your grid, you'll find Nicholas Sudik in the number 22 car, starting from P20. We are set for an absolute cracker. And do you think it's a case of, for the likes of those people not in the top four, interrupt it at turn one or just be dropped? You know, is it, is it all in? Well, the source is absolutely terrifying in its own right when you're under race pace, but when you're coming down with everybody else, I mean, if the opportunity's there and you hope, then you know for sure that you can get that car to stick, I'd say go for it. Yeah, I suppose it's a little bit that downforce argument again, because generally having lower downforce will help you with overtaking. You get the easy pass on the straights, if you like. But when it comes to turn one, when your tires are a little bit colder than you'd like them to be, extra downforce means extra confidence, means less braking zone. So it's certainly going to play out throughout this one. Obviously, the people who went particularly quick in qualifying might not have the best setup for the race either. So no idea how this one is going to play out is the, <laughs> is the theme of it. We can talk all we like, but uh, at the end, it's an Indy Pro 2000 race. Again, they, they pull away. Only a partial green flag lap, so all the more, I don't know, all the more foreboding. You've not got the chance to settle into your car, really, do you? Nope. You have pretty much this very short sequence, well, short in terms of pacing, and the next thing you know, you're going to get let right down in a way. Yeah. <laughs> it is all go, and there's not many laps in this one either. We're only looking at a 14-lap race. It's because the lap itself is seven kilometers, give or take a little bit. But we'll wait to get going now. Christoph Herbinho looking nice and racy on the inside. Alessandro de Tullio will be leading you away from pole position, however, and he's gone immediately out of the bus stop. Great getaway from Alessandro. Also a good getaway from Nikolai Hoheim, who's going to immediately take the position before they even get towards the braking zone. Third position drops into Nick. Oh, oh, drops into Christoph Harbinio for a moment. I thought Leobov was going to be too late, but it was actually brilliant from Leobov. Ozaretskovskaya moves herself up into the third position. They'll file all together down towards Orouge and Radion for the first time of asking. This you're looking at is the one car through the pack. Credit to them. They've all got it through for the first time of asking, and we go into Slipstream City for the first time. They're going to be three wide as they come towards the camel straight in the mid pack. Everybody trying to find a little bit of road, and as a result, they're all ended up on the same bit. A little bit of a change for the lead, potentially. Tulio's going to have to be defensive against Holheim. Holheim doesn't care. Into the lead. Fantastic move from the car with the yellow wheels. 
Will he go defensive down the hill is the question, because you know the attack's going to be coming pretty quickly. No, he's got the pace, he's got the confidence, and he's got the lead. Harbinho did not get going initially off the start. Luckily, manages to keep that car rolling back. Got himself back into that third place position. I'm getting passed for fourth place momentarily in the opening section, but man, mid pack is just absolutely insane as it was down that Kemmel straight heading into the first corner. I. Wow, that, that's something that I would pretty much personally have to just, just stay in the back and just watch everything play out in front as we ride on board the number two machine here through Puhan and now down the exit. Yeah, Nitty Mackey down in 17th position at the moment. It is a circuit where you can gain positions, so Miko won't be getting too worried yet. Already trying to just find a little bit of clean air potentially as they get towards the crucial corner that is Stavolo, turn 14. Ride a little bit of curve if you want. Nitty Mackey decides that they don't want to, and then you're flat. We get to go to Slipstream City for the second time. We've not even completed a lap. Now we are looking back at the 15 car. Trishan having to go defensive. It's going to squeeze Anne Medema. That's your championship leader. He has it all to lose, does Anne. And at the moment, has to just back out of it, be a little bit cautious, but has the run, has the Slipstream, has the trap, Ooh. has the braking zone. Going to be past one, past two, potentially towards the bus stop doesn't quite have the pace on the outside line but nonetheless a brilliant move to gain a position and he needs to because the moment championship contender is all the way down to 14th i believe medema actually has a three wide just up ahead that's something i'd also be worried about as a three of survey sepa backs out possibly unintentionally on the outside now has to watch this going all the way down through uh through Orouge and Radion, but I believe actually Medema lost a few positions on um, that first lap earlier. I did see him drop down the order uh, quite significantly, quite a few positions, so maybe trying to at least claw his way back here for this seventh place battle as we ride on board Steppa going side by side down the back straightaway. Could it be three wide potentially? It's going to get very, very tight. Sepp is in the awkward position of having the clean line, but not having the draft. Down the inside of both of them goes the 19 of Claudio Visparelli. Fantastic move in the McLaren-inspired livery. The three-car of Severe Sepp is losing a position to Frank Ewan as well. We said he'd be looking to make up positions quickly. He's doing just that. He actually takes a little look to the inside of Brussels, but that one's not going to work out. The seven's looking down the inside. There's tire smoke everywhere. Indy Pro 2000, as we love to see it, chaos everywhere, overtakes everywhere, and no idea of how this one's going to play out still. I mean, look at how bunched up everybody is throughout this entire section. It is just, I believe this is all pretty much, uh, pretty much just the entire back half of the field at this point, so it is a whole, it's like the front pack of the field has never even left, except it's a complete, it's, like, it's like a totally separate race. There we go. Uh, that's That just happens to be going on with uh, everybody else on track. Yeah, it's Visparelli down, and they're all fighting for that seventh position. It's a little bit ridiculous, but anybody that thinks they have the pace to contend with that lead group does need to make progress. They need to be looking to make it now. At least that's what Severi Sepa will be thinking. He's had some fantastic performances at times, but has a habit of getting caught up in the mid-pack. Same can be said for Frank Newen in that eight car, the purple livery. Got the fantastic draft, potentially looking to mimic what we saw Medema do last time around. He's going to go to the outside in exactly the same manner. Izzy is brave on the brakes. He'll pull up alongside and ahead of the 12 car, but he'll be on the outside of the bus stop. That becomes the inside at the final corner. He's got the position. He's got the oversteer as well, however, which means he doesn't have the drive, and he's going to have to try that one all over again. That is, if he doesn't move it out to Sepa, who's coming all the time. He's potentially got a nose alongside. Tepa thinks better of it, though, and to be honest, with still 12 laps to go, you'd say that's probably the wise move. That's definitely the wise move, and props to Nguyen there in the A, trying an outside pass for, I believe, the second time now, that, at least that I know of, and he's almost pulled it off once again. That's absolutely impressive. Yeah, really, really impressive. Notably at the front, Hoheim has it broken away. Alessandro Tertullio actually reclaimed the position last lap. Now Hoheim takes it back. Herbigno is somehow getting involved in it all, but it doesn't matter because at the moment there's going to be yet another battle pack as they descend into Lake Hoop for the third time of asking. Nobody quite brave enough, but a little bit deep potentially for Visparelli at the front of this pack. Clings on to it, but that just allows everybody to get that little bit closer once again. Just having a, a sniff here, a sniff there. Once you give a racing driver a little bit of temptation, you show them half a gap, you know they're going to try something. It's just in their nature. <laughs> Even if it's not actively trying to make a pass, it's more just placing your car as if you would make a pass to see if the uh, the other driver in front would react to that. So if they does, well, you better be prepared to take that line that you uh, 
pretty much half committed to, almost uh, fake committed in some cases. So it's it's a lot to think about here going uh, as we continue going down this middle sector. Just everyone not exactly knows the tail per se, but still, uh, of course, within striking distance. Yeah, I think that's the perfect phrase is within striking distance because they're not looking to force a move like you mentioned, but if a mistake happens, you're going to drop three or four positions potentially if it's the wrong part of the circuit. And you and now in the slipstream once again, you tried the outside last time, it didn't quite work for him. Will he manage to find the inside on this occasion? Well, he's tucked in the slipstream, he's having a little think about it beneath the diffuser near enough of that 12 car. Again, it's defensive from Visparelli to the inside. That might open up the inside for Nguyen. He's just a little bit too far back. Doesn't matter. He's so late on the brakes. He's got confidence in the front end to turn. Confidence in the back end to stick, but still stuck down in ninth position. Fringes of the top 10 for Nguyen because he can't quite get the move to happen on the 12 car. I might be wrong, but I, I, I believe he just barely hit part of the curb there, actually, on corner entry as well in, uh, in that instance. So just everything about that uh, that modern-day bus stop, essentially, everything about that during that time was just all sorts of wrong, unfortunately, for that lap. Yeah, here's your lead battle. This time it's Hoheim who's going to look to reclaim the lead. A fantastic duel occurring in the background. They're just trading positions up the Camel Straight because they don't want to lose too much time in the middle of the lap. That's why they have a gap to that pack starting from P7. So they're being clever about this. In the bottom part of your picture is the battle from P8 down the way. Visparelli no longer at the front of that one, actually. It's been led by Zutov, I think. So potentially a mistake. Everybody filing through as it stands. Visparelli still very defensive, actually. A little bit worrying. Doesn't seem to have the pace. Somewhat of a stopper in the bottle. As Jonathan Burke would say, the leaders curve through Puon. Very nicely done from Oheim. He opens up a couple tents there, which might be all he needs to hold the position for one additional lap. Visparelli still at the front of this one in the McLaren-inspired livery. Is Stepa going to have a little bit of a look? He's found his way past Nguyen on this lap. He's not going to have a look yet into turn 12, but you'd say that that one is... It's possible come the later stages of the race. You've got to, you've got to force it, but it's there if you really want it, right? Yeah, pretty much that. That is the case. I'd, uh, I'd also give bonus points if the uh, <laughs> McLaren Spark livery was uh, pretty much almost like their their a golf scheme that they had back in Monaco this past weekend, last week in this case. So, man, but either, either way down the final straight coming into the bus stop side by side giving a lot of space and Visparelli and I'll blame him taking that preferred lane to the inside and just like that almost keeps it gets the nose chopped off is the number three but still luckily both of them have everything intact. Yeah Koenigsfeld's looking to take advantage in the meantime because Nguyen had to check up on the exit to avoid Seppa down the inside of both of them for a second was Anne Medema has the championship to think about but at the moment simply isn't scoring enough points so all of those considerations go out the window here's the orange and black car that's Koenigsfeld taking a look to the inside of Nguyen not wise to do it there very brave potentially a little bit stupid so he thinks better of it now he's in the slipstream he pulls out he's got the overspeed unfortunately he's also got the outside line though so if he wants to make this work it's gonna have to be something brave Madema's gonna get into the middle of them he's already past Koenigsfeld is it gonna be two in one for Madema? it is and that's why they're in the championship hunt a little bit of magic just when he needs it and that brings him up a couple of positions towards the top 10 we could be looking at a seventh or maybe eighth position finish in this one quite realistically which considering Harbinho is currently in the lead not ideal, but it's not as bad as it was looking a couple laps ago. Just like that, Koenigsfeld still gets by a new one for that position regardless after everything that happened. A little bit of help from Medema's slipstream there just at the very end of the Camel Straight. Looking back at the uh, well, brewing battle in this case for first place, Herbinho and Hahan still first and second, at least for the portion of this lap. And well, that's that's the fun of this track is that you you just trade the lead back and forth, left, right, and center, no matter what. So, but I think Herbinho's actually Herbinho's done a bit a bit better through that actual through that section actually. By the looks of it, he's pulling a bit of a gap now. Yeah, it was it was very very smooth and controlled from Kristoff. So 
potentially a little bit left over in the tank. Of course, all of this is void because we then get on to <laughs> a completely flat section until you reach the bus stop, and that allows Hoheim to close up. And this is why the leaders are getting away. Look, nobody's gone defensive, nobody's gone to the inside. They're all just taking the racing line and sorting it out later. Moment of credit to Leobov Ozaretskovskaya, who qualified very well. She's been getting better and better every single race. And at the moment is in the hunt for a podium, at arguably the most difficult circuit on the calendar. So brilliant job from Leobov currently running P4. Absolutely incredible job. Unfortunate. Well, no, it might still just be in range uh, for a podium spot. We'll see how things play out a bit later on as the laps continue to wind down. Back at the uh, second half of the battle, it's 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 relatively tame so far. But well, down the chemical straight, it's going to be a completely different story, both for the lead and this mid-pack position as they might go three wide, trying to go defensive, and it actually is successful. Could he still get second place in the meantime? Yes. Wow, that was that was daring. It's still three wide for that mid-pack battle. Yeah, and Medema again makes up two places in one <laughs> section of the circuit. So the five car progresses up to eighth position. Now Seppa's going to hang it out to dry around the outside of Visparelli. So we didn't think Visparelli had the pace. And finally, the cars behind become a little bit impatient, started looking for something creative. Seppa definitely fits that bill and finds a way through in the three machine. Notably, we did say the leaders were <laughs> being a bit more aggressive until he could this time. It did give Hoheim about half a second's gap. And it's come down marginally, but that might be his, I don't know, his, his key to just go, you know what, it's flat out for this middle sector. I'm going to try and break the cars behind me. Because you can see it's not much bigger, but it's a couple car lengths now rather than nose to tail between first and second. And that will reduce the slipstream, reduce the amount they can close up to you on this straightaway section. And it just begins to put the onus on the person in second place instead of the leader, which obviously is always the goal if you're at the front of the field. Herbino is the one car you're looking at in that iconic, if you like, in this series now. It's absolutely stunning red, black, and white livery. Leobov's going to be under pressure from Maxime Kosson, who puts a nose to the inside. Leobov respects it, and the two of them get through Scott 3, but just shows the quality of these drivers that you can get away with something like that. There's a lot of fields where that little nose in would have gone very, very wrong, but it has cost them time there. A couple tenths away from the podium positions now. Yeah, we have seen, uh, in fact, earlier on in that same section where uh, someone's nose nearly got chopped off when trying to go for a move. So it was uh, both a, a bit of a combination of a late move as well as pretty much a driver just going for the regular move as well. On board Tulio, down the Camel straight with that slipstream, but don't expect Herbino to not just sit back and do anything. If he can catch up, actually, but I don't know, might be able to get second place. Nope, not in time. As Hauheim will slip right into that second place position, seeing that open position, saying, Oh, thank you very much. I will use this on that second half, uh, second portion of the lap, really. Well, third portion, I guess, technically, if we're talking sectors. Yeah, the, these three, you've, they'll be aware that they've got a gap to Kaston and Ozoretskovskaya now. And they'll, they'll be thinking, do you know what? It might be worth just just being smart about this one. Seppa, <laughs> Seppa and Miss Morelli are still going at it. We could just do an entire onboard race with Miss Morelli, to be honest, and you'd still get an entire evening's worth of action because they are nose to tail, sometimes even closer to each other than that as they get towards Puon. This one, I'll tell you what, I can't follow another car through there. There's a reason I'm in the commentary box, not in the racing seat, but it is incredibly difficult. Yep, I, I've mentioned uh, at the top of the broadcast, Puhan is, uh, well, it's a corner, and sometimes you get it right, sometimes I don't. Sometimes I go at least two tires off, which isn't too bad, but gosh, it is a, it's, it's sometimes a pretty difficult corner to get correct, uh, to be quite honest. So, again, it's, it's part of that fast sweeping corner section where these drivers have to have their setups for it, and well, three wide for the lead on the left hand side, or two wide rather, three cars battling for the lead, I should say. Uh, down the straightaway. No one really makes a move going into the bus stop as we come to the halfway point. No. I think they are aware of that gap they've got there. And they, they just kind of want to maintain that, I think. There's, 
there's time. They'll all have seen last season's race here, and they'll all be aware of what happened, and it was pretty much this. We started out with 10 cars for the lead. Leo Ozuretskovskaya is going to get what seems like a particularly easy move there, and I believe that was deep from Maxime Kasson, which is what's allowed that one to happen quite so simply. We're right on board with David Dendelot, who's got the best seat in the house for this one. Might even be contention for the position by the time we reach the top of the Camel Straight, because it was a brilliant run through Eau Rouge and Radion. Here's your battle for the lead. Christophe Herbigno, Delta Sport 4 UK, goes to the inside. He's got one. He's got two. Easy as you like for Christophe. And this is why we can't call this one, and who's going to win it, for another six and a half laps yet, because we know the overtakes are possible in the middle sector, but nobody's had the need to go for them yet. Exactly. And you saw there the distance between quite literally the top three and then fourth, fifth, and sixth who we're watching right now. And you think, well, that's only two seconds, two and a half seconds. That doesn't look like much. Well, it is, especially when it comes to the slipstream, which really doesn't take effect until you're probably about, about a quarter, about 0.75 seconds to about a second behind somebody. And even then, that's if you're down an actual straightaway. The leaders are still pulling the gap. Last time, like two laps ago, uh, more specifically, it was about two seconds at the start finish line. Now it's three seconds almost back to uh, uh, that last name I somehow cannot pronounce, but I've heard it so many times. Yeah, number 13. <laughs> I'm just going to go with the number 13. This is why car numbers exist in racing as well. But in the meantime, the, the leaders, like you said, they know they're pulling a gap, so they're going to have all of the space to work with here come the final few laps. You being scared of that name remind me of the first time Leobov showed up in this championship, actually. And uh, <laughs> neither me nor Jonathan were confident enough to go for it for about three weeks. <laughs> we were Googling every single time before we came on. But n still, we were thinking, do you know what? We'll just go for Leah Bob. And she is one of the fan favorites. She's a really good streamer as well from Russia. So credit to her. She's getting better and better. And this is arguably her best performance yet. Still on the hunt for a podium. Because uh, if you watched last season's race, you'll know that being in the lead fight, if anything, makes you more likely to get hit off when things get a little bit intense, a little bit exciting. I think we saw two or three people in that front group have contact this time last season. So it's not over until the checkered flag falls, particularly with the bus stop as the final corner. And it goes right back to exactly what you said, that so you can't call this race. And this is for one of those reasons that we see right now as Tulio goes all the way to the right hand side, swings right back up to the racing line. And just like that, back into first place as Ohan just sits back and watches this. Meanwhile, for seventh place, absolute chaos, as we see. Oh, well, not really, actually. Quite a, quite a bit sorted. As we move all our, as, as all the gyros move their way down back to single file throughout the sector. Man, oh man, it's a spin, actually. Contact is made. Everyone just gets by for the most part, but that's about half of that battle. Zudov and Madama actually might be involved as well. Yeah, Madama was, I think, fortunate to get away from all that. We'll get a replay. So that's Madama on the inside as they come in. Oh, oh it's huge no. contact. Madama did not get away with that one. That was Madama, and who else is? They're going to be a long way down Ooh, the now. That's in the racing line, too. Yeah, a lot of contact actually has happened there. So, Madama was again looking for a move, and that's why your leaders haven't gone for it in that middle section. Here's Anne Madama's on board. This is going to be scary, despite the fact we're in the simulator. It's the 12 car that they were alongside. To the inside, you got to say that's just two into one. It was not enough of an overlap to demand being left space, but enough of it that when the contact came, it was going to be big. And the thing that's oh, the worst for Matema as well is probably could have gotten back as well if, if, if just if that five car wasn't stuck on the back of that number 12, which could be wrong. It might have been Zudov. I saw it for a quick second, but uh, let's see. Oh, yeah, yeah, it was. Man, oh, man. Well, that's, that's very unfortunate for the championship lead there. Yeah, that is going to have a, a relatively big impact because Herb, you know, won't be aware of this quite yet, although Madema is in the pit. So before, pretty soon, Herbinho will see, oh, hang on, Madema's in the pits on my interval marker or my my gaps, or even potentially my, uh, my race engineer will tell me. So just takes the pressure off and you can go, 
second position is all right, or what I expect Christoph to take from this message is, I'm going for the win here. I'm putting it all in to try and get the maximum result. The four car is going to lead when we get to the end of this one. That's Nikolai Hoheim, who notably in Herbigno's races here, Herbigno started from pole earlier today, finished second. Yesterday started from third and finished second. The winner in both of those races was Nikolai Hoheim. So they've got a bit of recent history between them in this series. Just just a bit of recent history. So I'm pretty sure that both of these drivers, of course, will be keeping a, a very close eye on each other as Julio, meanwhile, just sitting here watching this with a... Uh, it's going to be watching this upcoming side-by-side -side battle with uh, a little bit of bucket of popcorn, actually, in, uh, in this race car. Yeah. Yeah, he'll be thinking... Oh, this is this is quite dicey. I'll I'll just sit back, conserve the tires, which we know are a factor in this series. Jack Ashton famously blitzed his tires on a couple of occasions and was drifting for about half the races. So it is something you have to account for, and all this fighting, driving offline, potentially going a little bit later on the brakes than you would want to be. It does use up the rears and the fronts that little bit more. It could affect your balance. And before you know it, Alessandro Tatulio will have them both as if they're not even moving as we've still got four laps to go in this one. Herbigno will close up once again, but I'd be surprised if he goes for it into the bus stop and absolutely spot on. I think that's one of the few things I've actually been able to predict in this series. <laughs> Doesn't go for it in the bus stop, instead tucks in and will no doubt be in the same position come the end of the camel straight, but he'll have a different car in front of him. That's my prediction. <laughs> oh, definitely. That, that's definitely going to be the case. And that, that brings up a, a very interesting point is that I think that now that these drivers know that they have a gap, they know that that second passing zone after, uh, after Blanchemont, it's, it's just not worth it at this point. Going to the bus stop, it's not worth it until maybe two or one lap to go that we know of. So all we have right now, or all the leaders have, is the camel straight. Which does change the dynamic a little bit, because I suspect somebody on the last lap will go for that. We've got battles up and down the field. It's going to be Herbigno that's going to lead in that one. Leo Bovozaretskov Skaya is going to get back up past David Dendelot, who's actually for a second going to take a second look. And then here's your battle. He's got Koenigsfeld at the front in the black and yellow. Seppa in the middle of him, of Koenigsfeld and Nguyen. Lurking in amongst all of this is Alexander Trishin in the red Ferrari car. New in around the outside of the first wow. part of Lake Kudum to gain the inside for the second, swoops in for the apex at turn seven. Brilliant racing from Frank Newen. He's not a double race winner in our broadcasted races this season for nothing. He is exceptionally quick and exceptionally good at keeping his car in one piece. In fact, brilliant job to those these four drivers in general. I've never seen two by two going through that going through those uh I guess still technically opening corners and not wreck. Even though it was a That's staggered tight. two by two. Wow, he's gonna go wide as well. He's gonna get forced wide by Seppa. Great opportunity there. And just like that, gonna try and go for that ninth place position. Here comes an iffy move potentially for Patrician, but <laughs> wasn't quite far enough alongside. I think Nguyen will be counting the lucky stars after that one, because if Trishan goes for that, your fate is completely out of your hands. Now we've got the fight happening then. Lap 11 of 14. And for a moment, there was a look through Blanchimon. We ride on board with Christopher Herbigno. He's looking at the back of Hoheim. Not close enough, but he did have a think about it. And the car is just beginning to get a little bit further away from the chests now as we approach the business end of this race. It could be wrong, but I think Hoheim actually uh, made that pass for the lead. But regardless, seeing them come to 2x2 uh, two two through Blanchimon, uh, it's only slightly terrifying, considering well that corner in itself is only slightly terrifying. Only uh, being topped by both the combination of tech, if we're, we're going to be technical, the combination of Eau Rouge and Radion. This just massive elevation change, my gosh! And you can see from this corner or this camera angle, if you looked in the background, there just cars flying up out of nowhere. The grandstands and the angle of that, it's absolutely impressive. Just like the pass from Herbigno, just saying hello, I'm back again in the lead, and well, just like that. Back to first place and again throughout all this, Tulio still just sitting back, waiting and biding his time. Which brings up the question all the drivers are be asking themselves, and I'm going to ask you: Come the final lap of this race, assuming the front three are still locked together, which position do you actually want to start that lap in? Is it first, second, or third that's optimal? 
to be quite honest, it's either second or third that you want to start that lap in. Well, now that I think about it, first or third if that you want to start the lap in. If you're third in this case and you're battling with two other people, well, you can just sit back, watch things happen, and then try and strike at the uh, at both the Kemmel straight and then that final blast uh, through Blanchemont, essentially, as Sappa and Kongsfeld still just battling. Battling this out as if it was for the lead, even though it's for ninth place on the on the timing sheets, essentially, but it's still absolutely impressive. One of the things that we've noticed about the guys in this series is they just love racing. There'll be people three laps off the lead and they'll just be going at it as if it's for the maximum number of points. These guys are in this series driving these cars because they really, really enjoy it. And that's exactly what you're seeing in this fight. Zeppa got very close to the back as they got towards Stavolo, but if you're going for a move there, it better be a good one because there's nine times out of ten, that one ends in disaster. Now they'll slipstream on the run towards Blonchamon. Well, that's turn 15 out of the way. Turn 16 and 17 at these next two. Very quick and actually surprisingly tricky left-handers. Sepp is going to go to the inside. Will request a lot of respect. And the 18 car of Kernigsman does give it to him. Sepp potentially lifting off. That's going to leave him under threat. Alexander Trishan to the outside of the bus stop. Doesn't quite have the braking power that we saw earlier on in the race from the demo here. Tried that outside pass and unfortunately didn't work, but props to everybody there through through giving all of the space possible. That's just absolutely, that's incredible. Giving amazing racing while also giving just, <laughs> just a, quite literally a wide amount of space. Although someone who's not going to give a wide amount of space is Tulio actually trying to go for the second place at least unless they go three wide. Tulio trying to get on the inside. Hoheim backs out, interestingly enough, so... Maybe, maybe trying something for that next lap. Yeah, a dress rehearsal, I reckon that was for Tulio. I wouldn't be surprised if he tries to pass somebody in towards the bus stop on this lap or, and put himself in the middle of the group. Here's Trishin wow. in the middle of Koenigsfeld and Seppa. Gets the move done. Koenigsfeld and Seppa are still at it. Koenigsfeld on the inside. He's going to try and force Sepp out wide. Sepp is having none of it. Sticks his wheel in. He's got the exit. He's all up on the curves. He's going to be the outside of the brick for the hairpin. How aggressive is Koenigsfeld with his defense? The answer is very, very respectful. In fact, they're still going to be side by side, neck and neck for a third corner in a row. Koenigsfeld hangs it out all the way around. He's got the exit speed as they go towards Puin, but he's going to be on the outside line. Yuan's trying to get involved as well. He's going to try and gain a position, hold a tighter line, take more speed through the double lefts. At turns 10 and 11, he's not close enough. Koenigsfeld's trying to fight back. All tucked up underneath the slip trim. He's got the overlap. He's got the inside line for Campos. That one's going to be bold. It's going to be even bolder from Sepp, who reads the rule book, throws it out the window because he doesn't care. He's got the position around the outside of turn 12. You love to see it. That was a fantastic sequence of corners right there, and that was... That was absolutely beautiful, and like you mentioned, reads the rulebook, probably read the rulebook, uh, read a couple pages of it, then decided to do the complete opposite, as Trishan had just gotten the right side tires on the grass, but with those three, in this case, battling, that has created a wonderful gap for Trishan for, uh, for this final lap. Yeah, Ewan's going to look to the inside, actually. He's going to, once again, try and be opportunistic, as we know he loves to be. Instead, however, it's him that's going to be taken advantage of. To the inside of Ewan comes Javier Horta. We've not spoken about him all race. Trying to get involved as well. Victor Reyes in the white car. To battle for the lead, however, it's on Camel Straight. This is the final lap of the race. Tulio is going to try and take advantage. There are going to be three wide last of the late breakers is who's going to come out on top of this one. It's Tulio on the outside. He's game one, but not game two because it's Hoheim potentially. It is at the front of this one then. Now we get to see what have they got in the tank? What have they got in the locker that they've not already shown because all the moves in this lead group have been in that first sector. It's going to be three, potentially four wide for the mid-pack battle. Newen in the middle, and he's bold as you like. Outbreaks everybody around him. They're going to continue fighting below. Koenigsfeld and Seppel once again going at it, as they did a lap ago. They've now, however, got people waiting to take advantage. Seppel's stuck on the inside. He's not got the overlap. The seven car of Victor Reyes is in amongst that. That's the white machine. The 17 is having a Horta who's going to sweep around the outside as he know has to tuck in. Seppa's still trying the move. There's Ooh. contact between himself and Koenigsfeld. They're both going to be slow. Here comes the 7 car. Victor Reyes 
from absolutely nowhere. It's oh no! The top ten, this massive contact. Three into one goes even less than two into one. Sep is off. There's wing damage for everybody. Suspension damage, I reckon, on that car. You leaders are on the run to the line. At the moment, it's still Holheim that leads the way. Herbino's trying to take advantage. Detulio's going to be on the inside. They're going to be three abreast. Massively wide goes Herbino. He wants all the speed, all the road. Who's going to be bravest into the bus stop? It's Detulio around the outside. Swoops for the second apex. Can he get the traction down? Herbino gives him a little tap. It's a drag to the line. It's going to be Holheim. It's going to be Tulio. I think it's going to be Holheim. Holheim is going to hold on from Alessandro to Tulio, who pushed him all the way within 26 thousandths of a second. Herbino was in the wrong spot at the wrong time. Couldn't take advantage. Here's Kurt expelled. This group having spades out afterwards. He goes a little bit defensive from Javier Horta. And he'll just about cling on to 11th. And Frank Ewan, actually, in 10th, will pick up the final spot in that top 10, which I tell you what, given the amount of fighting I had to do, I think you'll be quite happy with. Tulio almost had that. Oh my goodness. And especially with what pretty much led to an outside pass, but fantastic method nonetheless, and a fantastic race. And look back at what happened with the seven victory right oh it caught the curb i believe on the left hand side and that curb is absolutely deadly then seppa just gets bulldozed out of the way a third car involved as well unfortunately and i think the only survivor of that was the seven yeah that third car is victor Reyes. he was actually on a late charge towards the top 10. he seemed to have better pace than anybody around him but Unfortunately, not quite to be for him. This is wheel falls off towards the back of it. So yeah, you're right, the curb. clips the curb and then rear wheel on front wheel means both of them are going missing. And it's, it's a green machine that actually I don't think we'd seen all race. So who that is, is it anybody's guess? It's the 21 car. It's Harvard Gullickson. So unfortunate for Harlemford, who had tried very hard to get himself towards this group. And in the end, just got caught up when it all kicked off. Man, and, and the thing is, Victor Reyes, again, had that, just entered a bit, maybe maybe about half, like about, maybe, if I could figure out measurements here, uh, <laughs> if I could also figure out word choice here, just just so close, just clipped the curb ever so slightly, and that is how much uh, Puhan matters, is that that inside curb on the left will definitely come out to get you, and unfortunately, Victor Reyes was the, the unfortunate example of that. Yeah, here's your results then. Nikolai Hoheim takes yet another win. He pips Alessandro Titulio by less than half a tenth, about a quarter of a tenth, as tight as you like. We couldn't even call it as they came across the line. Christoph Harbinho, once again, the bridesmaid, not the bride, rounds out your podium. David Dendelop in fourth with Maxime Casson rounding out your top five for France. Leobov Ozaretskovskaya, fan favorite for a moment, looked like she might be on for a podium, but ends the race in sixth position, closely followed by Miko Nitimaki for Finland. Your top 10, rounded out by Claudio Visparelli, fighting hard the whole time, Alexander Trishin and Frank Nguyen, the last of those not involved in that incident that we'll see plenty of replays and highlights of, I'm sure. Jeffrey Koenigsfeld. 11th place for him. Connor Melia taking advantage of all the chaos, actually, to end up in P12. Javier Horta, he was on the hunt for that top 10, but he was very much in the midst of that accident. Finishes in 13 with Marcus Frentz and Carl JT Moore rounding out your top 15. Find them Victor Reyes. He clipped that curb, caused all of that, you'd say, although obviously not intentionally. He finishes in P16. Marcel Vandenberg is 17th. Nicholas Sudik, Harvard Gullickson, Mark Zudhoff are your top 20. And then you get to the people that are a couple laps down. Servai Sepa not making the end of it, actually, just as a result of that contact and the damage. And Madema, much the same, drove into the back of, uh, of one of the rivals. I believe that was Zudhoff, so uh, not great in the end for your championship contender. And Mitchell Ian Green, a race... Been. He's shown that he can be the mean green machine, but on this occasion, the machine never got rolling. He finishes in 23rd position. Here's your schedule. Just look to the bottom. We're going to Barber. That's the last race on the calendar. And if last season is anything to go by, if this season is anything to go by for that matter, 
it will be an absolute cracker. We're guaranteed to have a title fight down to the line between Herbigno and Medema. The gap coming into this week was just so small that it's always going to be up for grabs as we get to the final week of competition. And, well, <laughs> it will be good. I can guarantee you that. So make sure you're back this time next week and you'll get all the action. It will be an absolute cracker. That's just about it, however, from this week. You'll get a few incredibly beautiful slow-mo shots, but thank you to you, Gary, for joining us. And uh, thank you to Hugo for giving us fantastic pictures, fantastic race direction, and fantastic everything, to be honest. Hugo's just a fantastic man. And thank you, of course, to Istvan Balo for the cameras and everybody involved here at Race Spot TV. Crucially, we hope to see you next week. Have a good one, guys.